Street. This is Heather Montgomery on the 6th of the 8th, 2022 at Fermanagh House, gathering oral histories. My name is Raymond Scott, uh, born and raised in a little hamlet called Basnarik, close to Castle Archdale. I was uh, brought up in a row of houses called Johnson Drive. Uh, they were prefabs, or as we refer to them as orlets. They were purpose built, uh, quickly built, and they had very, very basic amenities in that, those particular days. We had no running water. We had an outside toilet. Um, we didn't have electric. Uh, so they were very, very basic. And one of my abiding memories of the Orlitz was, whereas they were very cosy and very warm, they only had one door into the house and one door out of the house. And particularly in winter time, the windows were steel frames and we seemed to have really bad winters in those particular days because you would get up in the morning getting ready for school and lo and behold you used to have to hold your hands up against the window so that you could actually see out the windows were frozen solid but and saying that there were happy days because we really knew no different or no better but as time progressed we got running water we got electric and um, street lighting, everything uh, what we needed. So I lived there from 1952 until I got married in 1973. So I was well aware of the shortcomings of those houses, but as I say, there were happy times and happy days as well as the inevitable sad times. But really, I'm here to talk about my little village which I really have very fond memories of and maybe I'm very precious about it but I'm going to hopefully talk about it and give you an insight into what it was like growing up in the village um, and I'll cover a few it's more social aspects of it and I will talk about the village uh, what it was like to grow up in it I will mention about the Castle Archdale estate which was very relevant to this particular area because of the close proximity to Lisnarik and what it what it entailed. Um, I will talk about school days, uh, the good and the bad, and I'll finish up with some of uh, church life. Again, it'll not be a preaching sermons or things like that, but it's just to give you an insight into uh, what it was like for a young boy growing up in that particular time. So. Oh, it sounds great, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So if you bear with me, I will kick off and I'll t tell you a few stories and uh, fill you in a few details of the village of Lisnarik. Now, I hope that the, most of this is all gospel through, but um, as I say, it's my memories, so uh, hopefully it will give you an insight into our life. The Snarik is a little village uh, It consisted of approximately, in those particular days, of possibly 40 to 50 dwellings. It's a totally different aspect now. Um, there was very few houses had electricity and there was absolutely no street lighting until 1959-60. There were two little shops in the village that sold mainly grocery provisions and uh, one public house. I remember vividly going to the shop with my mother and um, in those days tea was in a huge big tea chest. Um, there was no chilled units. There was these huge big uh, round barrels of cheddar cheese. Um, the rolled bacon was sliced off the roll. Uh, the bread was supplied. It used to come in a van from the Oma, the, it was the old model bakery, which is now defunct unfortunately, and uh, from memory it had the loveliest, crispiest uh, crust on it that you could die for, not very healthy I suppose, but in those days, who cared, you know, I was only a child. 
and the both shops had the obligatory huge big tech books. Uh, I didn't fully understand those until later later times when these big books were came out and the, the ladies would come on a Friday evening and settle up their their weekly provisions. It, they got their all their groceries during the week and then when their husbands uh, produced the pay the pay packet of that at the Friday evening, then it was off to the pay pay the the grocery bill. The the public house was a focal point for a lot of the older people, the older men, there would have been very few uh, females would have frequented the pub. Uh, it would have been, in, well, I suppose in those days, of basic standards, um, again, outside toilets, a little bar, what commonly is known as a snug, and really all it was was bottle Guinness. There was no such thing as draft beers in those particular days. And uh, it was just the hub of the village for the gentlemen who swapped tall tales and yarns, some through and some very untrue. <laughs> Talking about the, the men, there would have been a lot of characters lived in the village. And outside the pub, which was called, um, it was Hugh John, it was Hugh with a, an H, but everybody called it Q John's uh, pub. And outside, built into the side of the wall was, I'm sure some people might be aware, of milestones. And it was built into the side of the, the gable wall of the pub. And that was the prize seat by the old men who would grab it. And then they would hold court and re regale everybody with all these tales. And um, sometimes ghost stories seemed to be a favoured topic and us young shavers would be going home scared out of our wits, particularly when we had to walk in the dark. Um, the um, individuals, uh, they all seemed to, majority of them seemed to have nicknames, which we could never really understand. Now, I'm, I'm not going to give the name of the person, but I'm going to give you some of the nicknames that was it was used, and these are so random. I don't know whether <laughs> whether they make sense or not. Uh, the nicknames: there was a man called the Shark, another the Crane, another person was called Bo, uh, the Bucko, Colonel Flatsoles, uh, the Walser, the Cannon, the Rabbit, Jakers, G God, Deadly. The cat and another man whose name was Jimmy Buns. These all names had been handed down by generations, but uh, this is all they were referred to as. Uh, often, well, most times they were never called to their face, but they were always talked about behind their backs. Um, some of those gentlemen would have been um, uh, would have served in the First World War and the war there their medals with pride, you know, at, at certain times, which they were quite entitled to do. Leaving aside that, the social life now, again, we didn't have any uh, dance halls or ballrooms or nightclubs in those particular days. There was an orange hall, and it was the centre of the village for the hub of activities. There was dances, there was parish guest teas, concerts, where all the local budding artists thought they could sing or play instruments, and some of them were roundly booed off the off, off the off the stage. Christmas bazaars were another thing. Uh, I'm sure some people would remember the old click of the rickety wheel as it was spun round, uh, and some of the prizes. Well, there was a lot of prizes, but one particular prize is number of prizes that it sticks out in my mind was in those days live fowl were brought as prizes and they were tied in hessian bags and always but always some joker would always let the bag some open the bags and here you would get some of the people chasing around after geese turkeys hens and it was used to be bedlam in the hall but uh, it was all good fun, but possibly nowadays it wouldn't be looked upon as very, very uh, animal friendly. We also had a, a troop of 
uh, a variety troupe come always used to come every year from uh, the south. It was called the Good Companion Show, and it was uh, it was a family by the name of Haydens, and Clary Hayden was the 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 father and the, the patriarch and they used to put on plays and as I say to a young seven or eight year old you know it was the to us it was magic it was fantastic and they used to put on these plays particularly ones three act plays seemed to be the norm and they would uh, be a lot of um, sentimental ones about people moving to America from the hills of Donegal and it was uh, some plays were called the Red Barn Mystery uh, there was one particular time they put on uh, a Frankenstein which caused an absolute riot and it scared the life out of <laughs> out of all the people in the hall and everybody uh, stampeded for the door when Harry or when Clary Hayden rose up from his um, from the dead and we had film shows as well um, our local minister at that time was a McMurray Taylor and he was a great enthusiast uh, and would have always when members of the parish would have got married his wedding present was a gift of his uh, Cine 8 film of their wedding and you know a lot of the the older generation would have very very treasured memories and keepsakes like that because in those days nobody very few people even had a camera and a cine camera was almost unheard of but he used to do this and that was his gift to the the the, the, the wedding couple and as i say he was away ahead of his time he came to castle archdale and Killadees in the middle 50s and he was the minister for the both parishes he was a veteran of the normandy landings he was the padre that was uh, landed on on one of the beaches in normandy and he he seen a lot of action throughout throughout the war years obviously something he would have very rarely spoken about and he also was a great man for brewing his own beer and i can testify to that because on the, I had to go to see him on one of my uh, nights before I got married. I had to go and visit him, and I remember coming home, not realizing where I was or who I was, because of the Reverend McTory, McMurray Taylor's rather strong, <laughs> strong beers. So that was that was the social that social aspect of it. But it was a great community uh, feeling about the place because during those days there was no there was no difference made between anybody's politics or religion. The mere fact they weren't even ever discussed because at some of those uh, parish guest teas and concerts there might have been fundraising for the local Orange Lodge and you would have um, people from other faiths would be coming, playing Irish music, uh, Irish dancing, and everybody was accepted and treated with respect. And, you know, for those memories alone, I am really grateful. And we also had on the, in the village, we have a very unique village green. It's a three, it's a triangular village green, uh, based on, a, I think of the Archdale family who settled in there in the, 1600s um, designed the village green as something similar to an English uh, village and again on that particular place we had travelling fun fair shows uh, where they used to have um, I don't know whether maybe the younger generation there were swing boats uh, hoopla somebody telling their fortunes and things like that and um, uh, coconut shies and again it was a source of entertainment for everybody because you used to go to the village green gather up and all these bright lights it was it, you know it was something that was unique so that really was all we could I can remember about the village as such we had a, a s soccer team 
Um, a lot of the boys would have played in a in a local team and uh, p uh, participated in a f the Mercer League in the Fermanagh and Western. Never totally successful, but still it was a source of entertainment and uh, leisure for the boys, and it kept them out of mischief. And in later years, then we organised through our club um, a ladies' team. So everybody had a good time, but it 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 was the camaraderie and the just the companionship that seems so lacking nowadays. As one of uh, I recall, one of our residents came back to live in Lisnarik. Uh, she had lived in London for all her uh, adult life, and she said, you know what I really miss is the half door, where I could just uh, lean out and talk to my neighbours, but she got a very rude awakening because that did not exist anymore. And now Lisnarik is a village where at, th those, at that particular time everybody knew everybody else and looked out for people. But as time has marched on, um, there's uh, an influx of new people, new blood to keep the thing taking over, new housing estates, and it has grown enormously, and possibly it has lost its uniqueness that it had in those days. But it's still, it's still a grand place to live, and we've safely came through all the trials and tribulations of various uh, decades. And um, never really once had anything that we could uh, give us any really bad cause for concern and worry. Uh, we are totally uh, graffiti free and long may it continue. That would really cover my basis for Castle uh, for Lisnarik. Um, I would like possibly then to talk about Castle Archdale Estate because it had a, a rather big bearing on the village because when the estate was uh, in its heyday when the Archdales were there uh, they were big employers in the area they had a massive um, estate and the majority, the vast majority of the people that lived in the village their families would have all been working in what was referred to as the big house um, I remember talking to people now long deceased who would have been a ma uh, one particular lady was a maid in the in the house and she ref you know uh, recalled what what they had to do and all but um, as I say it was the village was linked in inextricably to the to the to the castle but um, Unfortunately, in 1941, the castle was requisitioned by the RAF and they uh, took it over and developed it as a flying boat base uh, for the Sunderlands and the Catalinas who patrolled the, the North, North Atlantic looking for the, the, Ameri uh, the German U-boats. Um, and uh, this seen an awful huge influx of military personnel and civilian personnel who were working there um, in the in the camp, and as I say, a lot of the people that had worked on the castle arts to the state were re redeployed into it. But there still was an awful influx of uh, civilian staff. And um, again, I remember as a six-year-old, my mum and dad both worked in the in the in the Nafi camp. My father came from Fintna and my mother came from Clocker and uh, they met and married there during their time working but uh, w one of my memories was uh, my father was in the charge of the Naffy shop uh, where the, obviously the soldiers or the RAF personnel and anybody could go in and buy their uh, sweets and treats and bread and things like that and one of my abiding memories of it was he used to travel over, he used to drive a, a van over to the Bundorn Junction, which is outside Irvinstown, and it was a, uh, connected to the railway line. And I mentioned previously about the model bread. So the model bread must have really went down well because 
they used to send the, the model bread come up from the bakery in Oma and it was left off in uh, the um, Gondorn Junction and my dad he used to gather it and pile it all on, into the van and we used to go back with that and I can still have memories of seeing all these cakes and pastries and all the bread and again it's one of my abiding memories of it. Uh, my mum she worked in the naffy uh, in the canteen in the kitchen and again here this is where I got my first introduction to seeing a television uh, because I remember being told to sit in the sit in the officers officers mess while uh, I got something uh, when my mother was finishing off something and one of the RAF officers came in and he said to me in a very clipped English accent he says young man would you like to watch television and I looked at him and I says what and I asked him what's television and he sort of stifled a laugh and he says that's a television sitting over there and I looked over and I seen this square box with a little tiny screen which might have been about 14 inches wide and he says I'll put it on for you and uh, he says I let you watch something. He says, "What?" I says, "I don't know. I I've never seen a television before." Well, he says, "You sit there, and I'll put the television on." And here did not Andy Pandy come on the television, and I sat and watched Andy Pandy with my eyes out on stocks, uh, my mouth uh, uh, agape, and couldn't understand it. And he sat, and I think he j he didn't laugh at me. He laughed with me because he couldn't I think it was the reaction I got and then he says sit on and we'll watch another and then on came Bill and Ben the flower pot men and this that always stuck in my memory for and still does my first introduction to television of course when I went home I talked to my mother and father and uh, badgered them about getting a television but television never came into our house until <laughs> until the 60s but uh, again it was something that I wouldn't have experienced only for the fact of the RAF camp in there and then um, the RAF when the war obviously had finished in 45, 46 but they remained there until 57 and um, then there was a detachment of uh, our, the regular army appeared because there had been a border campaign as it was referred to had broken out where there was hostilities between uh, the IRA and uh, the, the north here and they were based down there albeit uh, on a very small basis because most of the, camp, the army camp had been dismantled and sold off and um, It, sorry. Okay. Um, it, it eventually closed in the in the mid sixties, and it was returned to the Archdale family, where eventually one of the Archdale uh, descendants turned it into a caravan park, and a marina, and um, it is now a country park owned by government sources. So that was my uh, m memories of Castle Archdale. Again, good memories and bad memories, but uh, uh, very vivid memories. Um, I will go on to possibly now my school days uh, in in the Snarik. Our school was a little a little two two room school uh, with a boiler house on the side. Um, if you were uh, if you'd uh, sort of behaved yourself well during the week. You got the honour of going in and having uh, having to apply the coke. I mean, I mean coke as in uh, uh, coal into the boiler to, to heat the, the, the school. Um, it had outside toilets, <laughs> no mod cons, and we had an air raid shelter, which was a relic from the war years because, as I say, we the school was again in close proximity to the the. RAF camp and um, we had no school meals we brought our own 
lunch. Uh, we got a pint, a third of a pint of milk supplied every morning. Uh, frosty mornings you usually find the milk frozen or if you were very unlucky, the blue tits had approached them and packed the tops of the, the gold tops off them or the silver tops and helped themselves to the, the cream or the milk. And um, there was very few cars in those days, uh, so w we all walked to school. Uh, I would have walked possibly about a mile and a half to two miles there and the same back, obviously. And um, again, you felt safe or your parents felt safe because there was very, very little traffic on the roads and there was very little green cross code and there was there was no sort of uh, basic training in how to conduct yourself on the roads. But common sense prevailed and that's how it went. And while the, the army, the RAF and the army um, personnel were there, the families they had their families there and some of the families the children used to come to our school and there was these strange accents from different parts of England and uh, but they you know they were very shy children because and they probably they didn't understand us the way we spoke and they we didn't understand them but it was it was a learning curve and it, it helped you know for the future and they were normally picked up in a, a big uh, arm or ambulance, a military ambulance, and they used to always get into the back of it. But if you got a, a kindly driver, he used to let us into the back of the ambulance and used to bring us down and drop us all off in the village. And we thought we were the bees and knees traveling and traveling in this particular vehicle. Uh, I suppose uh, very few other villages or schools in the in the area could could sort of uh, claim that that the, you know they had that particular uh, mode of transport home, and uh, as again I stayed at that particular school until I was um, went to Enniskillen Technical College in sixty two, and after that, well, my life changed totally because uh, I would have been spending more time in Enniskillen there most of the day and very little to do at night just come home do your your homework and but as I say looking back on the, on the village life it really was it was a, it was a good time can I ask you did you have favorite subjects in school or was there things that you really yeah. hated or was there uh, yes uh, on school subjects my uh, my pet hit well I had two Maz and uh, uh, well it's a branch of maths which was fractions I couldn't do fractions and I remember I I passed 11 plus uh, but for uh, for some unknown reason I do not know how I have passed but on, on recollection I remember one of our neighbours uh, a, a boy by the name of Paddy McDonough unfortunately now deceased Paddy lived two doors from us and Paddy was already uh, attending the tech, and he was a whiz at um, fractions and uh, uh, arithmetic. And Paddy used to come up and do my homework for me in the evenings. And I remember the master at at school wondering. He used to be scratching his head, wondering, "Young Scott, how did you manage to do those?" And uh, I would say, "Well, I just sat down and worked at the master grundle." <laughs> But I can thank Paddy for my, my for, uh, for passing my eleven plants. But I really loved history and English, and that was what I excelled at, and that's what I I went on to uh, qualify through through my my education in in, in English and uh, history, uh, English literature and language. So that's just one thing I want to pick, ask you is I never asked you had any siblings. No. Well, I had two, oh, right. but they died before I was born. Oh, okay. But you see, I didn't know whether to mention that. No, no, I was just but, uh, curious. Uh -huh, no. Uh, okay. um, and are you going to tell me something about yourself in terms of what you did go on to do in your employment and what you've done? Yeah, uh, w well... I'll just continue, yeah. Do, you know, I'll finish that. this and then I'll, I'll do a, a, I suppose, how are you for time?
don't have to. Right. Um, I'll just go into the church slide because yeah, that's fine. Couple, there's a couple of interesting things in it, I think. Um, the school days were uh, interlaced with my our, our, my church life. My father was a very um, keen church goer. Um, I would have been sort of rather hesitant. I I would have went uh, at a pinch, but I was I was not forced, but I I was left in no uncertain terms, and I had to come to church, and uh, I would have attended with my dad. Uh, again, it was pretty primitive. It was gas heating, uh, uh, some sort of boil, uh, heating. I'm not sure what it was, but the church was always inevitably you would have froze in it, and the hard chair, the hard pews were awful so they were and again the old men would gather out prior to the going in for the the church service they would always gathered up about 15 20 minutes and uh, the week's events would be discussed and chatted and a, a sly cigarette would be smoked outside before they all trooped in into the church and I always remember the harvest service our pews they used to tie the little uh, had little sheaves of corn and they were tied to the to the outside of the pew, and our harvest services were usually at night, and you used to sit and pick off the little pieces of corn, and uh, I remember the minister coming, preaching the next Sunday and mentioning, saying, "Look, would all the children refrain from picking at the the corn because we're running out of sheaves of corn to keep us to keep keeping the church." Of course, we got scolded for that, but one of those things. Um, Remembrance Day was a big thing in our church because, again, with the fact that we had the 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 RAF there first, and then the army, uh, it was a very big day in our calendar because the RAF, firstly, used to march out of the camp in full ceremonial dress. And it was a sight to behold, you know, for young boys or any, uh, you know, to see soldiers in uniform, you know, you know, you're all agog watching these, these uh, men stepping out and, you know, just looking so, just like toy soldiers, and then there would be, the bug, they have the the buglers and they would stand at the door uh, into the church, and when the names of the fallen were being read they would have played the last post so we would have been very unique in that aspect because I don't think again there would have been very many churches would have had that facility of of uh, having you know uh, uh, RAF and arm, army personnel coming out in full ceremonial dress it was it was a fantastic sight which church was it? Castle Archdale Park St Patrick's Castle Archdale Church uh, it was just at the entrance into Castle Archdale We also uh, were. I am also lucky to remember the fact that we, our Sunday school outings up until the railway closed, we travelled to Bundorn uh, for Sunday school outings, and it was also uh, an exciting time to be out on a train again. Not very many people would have been using trains, but we were lucky. The train passed by, uh, Lisnari just, uh, you know. In a very sh- a very short distance away, and uh, again that was up until the, the railway closed. Memories like that are you know they stick in your mind and you don't forget them. And one of the last tasks I remember having to carry out, uh, a particularly sad case was, um, I was had I had completed my eleven plus and I was still going to school, but I was really twiddling my thumbs and the Reverend McMurray Taylor uh, called up at the church or up at the school and asked me, asked the Master Grundle, he says, could I borrow Raymond? He serves for an hour and a half. He says, I wanted to pump the organ. Uh, there was a funeral service. It transpired that there was a young, sho- a young soldier had uh, Shot was shot himself dead in Castle Archdale in the camp, 
it seems they had been playing Russian roulette and he shot himself. It was it was only in later years that I found out that that's what had actually happened because it was all hushed up and again as I say that sticks out in my mind and also the volley of shots that was fired over his graveside. And his grave is in Castle Arsdale and I often go and look at it at the times and look at his age and realise he was only 19 when it, that happened and that was in 1961. Uh, um, yeah. So, would you like to tell us anything about your actual, uh, mm -hmm. your what you've done as through yep. your life? Then yep. it would be lovely to hear a bit more of. Right. Uh, no, Heather. How does that sound? I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's everything I would have liked to have heard from mm -hmm. every other person mm -hmm. we've spoke to, mm -hmm. and I'm being genuine when I say that. Thank you. It's a lovely summary, and mm -hmm. I actually was sitting um, when you were talking about. Um, the, the fates and the activities and stuff going mm -hmm. in and around the church. There's a lot of the wee things you've said. I obviously I was born in the 60s, mm -hmm. but a lot of the things I can reflect upon. Mm -hmm. um, and I could have imagined it. I really yeah. could have. And you've took me to the Faro Handy Pandy in the Bill mm -hmm. and Ben because then <laughs> I remember those as well. So yeah. lovely memories, yeah. lovely Good. memories. Right. Um, this is going to be off the hoof now. It's fine. It's um, fine. This bit here, I maybe just put. I, what I would like to have just is. Um, a bit of information, more background of you, mm -hmm. as in like what you did after you left school, what maybe your employment was, were you ever married, many kids you mm -hmm. had, just basic information that I can add on to this. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it a bit morbid if I say that I had two siblings or should I leave that out? Well, it's up to uh, no, me. It's no, 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 how do you feel? I, I don't mind. No, well, you've but two, I, uh -huh. I mean, some of the stories are that there's, there's families of nine, only mm -hmm. which have Mm -hmm. say six survived mm -hmm. and two of them. Are you the eldest of three or the mm -hmm. youngest of three? Are you the middle of three or whatever the case may be? Right. So you, you just want me to talk about myself then? Uh, uh, going go on, go on to the technical college or just... Hey, just from when you went to college, mm -hmm. what you did after as a mm -hmm. career mm -hmm. and maybe just a wee bit about your, uh -huh. your life. And yep. the, the right. Well, I, uh, after leaving the Little primary school, I went to the technical college in Enniskillen and uh, was in a class of, um, it was a bit of a culture shock from being in a class of about five, I went into a class of 34 boys and uh, we sort of plied our trade and, and learning between this and huts in, in the school because that was the that was the most of the, the buildings. The actual building itself was the old county jail and um, the headmaster's office was in the governor's house and the gymnasium and some of the uh, commercial subject uh, classes where mostly the girls were was the actual prison block mm -hmm. and uh, you could th they were still there in certain degrees and you could see actually we were showed what the showed where the condemned cell was where the 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 man that or the person was taken out and hanged on the on the on the called the the, the jail square mm -hmm. so it had plenty of history in it but as i say i stayed there for up and i went there in 62 and stayed there until 69 and um got all my well not all my uh, all my education i went as far as getting a levels in english i english lang and lit in english literature unfortunately the class i was in i couldn't do history but one of my old tutors uh, a lady i have very fond mo memories of she was a mrs Lavery. Uh, her husband and her owned a pub in this below called the wild duck inn and he was an ex-army major but she took me under her wing and uh, in those days uh, she obviously spotted s some sort of a, uh, a calling for me but uh, she got me uh, a junior reporter's job with the Belfast Telegraph but the sad bit about that is being an only child and having 
lost two siblings before I was born. Uh, my mother sort of um, pulled at my heartstrings and I didn't go. And I do have regrets about it, but you can't live in regrets. But uh, I know Mrs. Lavery was very disappointed about the whole thing. And But anyway, I then I acquired a post with the Fermanagh Education Authority and worked there for four years. Uh, in that time, I met my future wife. I met her at a, a football club dance. She dinner dance. She she came along with. Uh, she was from Fintna. I'd never met her in my life before. She came from Fintna with uh, her boss, uh, her and a couple of other girls. And as she said to me afterwards, she said, I hadn't a clue where this night was. <laughs> and we, um, I asked her out on a date. We met her. This was around Christmas, and. Uh, well, the rest is history, and we're now in our 49th year of marriage. And if I see the 23rd of March, 23, we will be celebrating 50 years of marriage. Uh, we have two children, um, a boy and a girl, uh, both married, and we have three grandchildren. And as I say, as obviously my mum and dad are both deceased but um, as I say they lived in the house that we were we lived in Johnson Drive they, they both that's where they lived the rest of their life and as I say that's that's my background I then left Castle Archdale uh, sorry I left from an education and went to work and <laughs> uh, strange coincidence I worked in Castle Arstill uh, for the ca as a caravan park manager for uh, up until 1986, and uh, it was happy days. I made a lot of very good friends. Um, it was a lot of sad times as well. I had to deal with a few fatalities on the on the on the lake where people had drowned, and just a few sad sad episodes. After that I went to work on Oma. Ended up down in Derry stroke Lumpen Derry. Uh, uh, a name uh, a name that I didn't realise and possibly showed how naive I was in my younger life. I didn't realise that there was a difference until I was about 24, 25. That there was a different uh, it was a, a rather striking difference in who called it yep. Derry and who called it London Derry. But maybe that was a reflection on my upbringing, living in Lesnarik and all the happier for it. I then worked there and retired and now just do a little bit of um, painting, uh, go to art classes, do some painting. Uh, I'm not gifted in the... Um, with my hands as in making things or anything like that. Uh, my wife wouldn't let me do anything whatsoever. Uh, uh, I suppose it's I still have uh, the artistic side of me and uh, the manual side is totally out the window <laughs> for my sons. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to say thank you and I'm going to turn that off. Right. Are you, are you, no, I didn't